So hello, everybody. Welcome to The Everyday Trader. This is Eric Hale with Trader Oasis. And I'm joined with, uh, with of course, Greg's here today. Say hello, Greg. Hello, yes. everyone. Yes, Welcome hello. again to another episode. And our, our featured special guest today, Mr. Barry Norton. Say hi, Barry. Hey, everybody. How are we all doing? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So uh, we've been doing these uh, recordings, trying to bring some insight to you people, some things on the markets and ideas and option trading. And Barry's uh, somebody that Greg and I have known for a long time. I mean, I don't know, 12, 13, maybe even longer than that, Barry. Since uh, uh, early 2011, I became a member of Options Animal after hearing Greg McAllister give a, 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 a talk. I forget exactly where. And I signed up. And then I think three months later, became a life member. There you go. Well, we're glad to have you. And Barry is an example of why I'm, I feel lucky to be part of this community, part of this association, is we've got <clears throat> lots of smart people who bring a lot um, to you know, this community and help us uh, grow and learn. And, you know, that we all challenge each other. Uh, Barry brings some really extensive experience in fly fishing. So we were just talking about that. <laughs> Well, we were talking, talking about the many different ones we could. We said fly fishing. We could do one of these episodes on our differences yet love for the the sport of baseball. Or All three of us baby. are passionate fans <laughs> for different teams. We could we maybe even do one on playing craps together. We could. Craps. You know. Ooh, yes! I think all three of us have played craps together too. Yes, we have. Yeah, we have. Barry had the foot, the baseball game on the TV behind him uh, before we get started here, watching the Giants game. And he has Giants hat on. You took your Giants hat off. That's, <laughs> baseball hats are cool, man. It's that's cool. And and these guys were just talking about their favorite fly rods and and fly fishing. Uh, if you're an economist, you're in econ in economics. You're you're automatically a fan of fly fishing. And the history of that is that Paul Volcker. They were trying to get Paul Volcker to come to the Kansas City uh, Federal Reserve which covers Wyoming. So this is Jackson Hole's the famous big economic summit that happens every summer, summer. And all of the economists go up there and all of the economists fly fish. And it's because of Volcker. It's, they were trying to figure out how are we going to get Volcker to come to Kansas City? Um, and then they said, well, Wyoming's actually part of the Kansas City Fed. Um, let's tie in some fly fishing. And Volcker said, I'm there. And that's the history behind really? it. Yeah, that's the reason why. I did not know that. Yeah, that's the reason why. And so- now it's just one of these things that every economist you meet, if you ask them about fly fishing, they they have some, some <laughs> most of them I think do fly fish, but some of them have excuses why they don't. I, I don't think Janet Yellen is a is a big fly fisher. She likes to go hiking, but um, but there is a, a lot of economists who go. Fly Janet's fishing. a Janet Yellen's an economist. <laughs> I, thought she was a, I thought she was just a politician. Well, yeah, exactly. Well. She did have the casting ponds in San Francisco she could have gone to and learned uh, how. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here to talk about um, economics or fly fishing or baseball. Um, Barry uh, brings a lot of expertise um, in the area of semiconductors. And I I mean, I, every time I talk to Barry, I, I, like an hour goes by and I just feel like, well, we just I just learned a ton. Um, Barry has a ton of experience in that area. And, um, you know, he, he can bring um, some knowledge that we wanted to share with the rest of the community. I think there's really two, two things. There's a lot of things people can get out of this, but one of them is just to see the level of effort that Barry puts in for doing his due diligence and try, trying to do his background. He's not, you know, one of these people who's shooting from the hip. Um, I'll let you talk more about all of this before you give me, I'm going to have you give an introduction, but I just want to set the stage. <clears throat> I think people who are watching this, I think you should be, you can, you get two, I think there's two things you're going to get out of this. One is you're going to say, Hey, here's another guy who's a retail trader who's out there trading. And this is the level of effort that he puts into his trading. He's not willy nilly out picking equities, you know, off of some website or some newsletter. He's doing a lot of due diligence and background. Um, but then we're also going to learn some things from him about uh, specific companies and stocks and, and ETFs and learn a little bit about them and, and a little bit about the technology as well. So I think there's two aspects for people to pay attention, but Barry, did, Greg, did you want to say anything before we get going? <clears throat> um, no, other than I appreciate, you know, you coming on, Barry, like Eric said, I'll mention, you know, we've been good friends for a long time and Barry's been a, uh, 
it has become a friend. We haven't seen each other in way too long. So we need to maybe get together this summer and throw some flies together. That'd be fun. I'd love to. Yes. No options animals has been like my second family. I didn't go to my first uh, summit until 2013. And I'm still friends with the people that I met at that very first summit. That's awesome. It, it is. Definitely. So Barry, why don't you um, just kick off a little bit about your, you know, your background? Um, Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, after uh, after going to after going to college to be in finance and and do different things, I I fell into semiconductors, and I think it more of it picked me than I picked it. Um, you know, come back to California. What do I want to do? Thinking about my career, and I said, well, well, I got to put food on the table. Let me go and take a job. And I took a job with this company where I was an inspector inspecting metal parts, something I'd done while I was in college. They call it a metrologist, learning how to inspect metal parts. And um, they hired me and started off as an inspector. And they were in the semiconductor capital equipment industry. And our main customers were applied materials and LAM research. And um, so I got kind of thrown into semiconductors just by that. And as I grew in the company, um, I forgot about business and became fascinated with manufacturing and semiconductors. Um, we would go through a series of acquisitions with folks that want to get into the industry. And uh, when they made mistakes, we had opportunities where I was able to step in with two other partners and buy the company. We would then sell to a company called Flextronics. And by this time, I'm general manager. Um, and Flex opened us up to a whole world of manufacturing. Um, Flextronics, like J Bell and Foxconn, who builds the iPhone for Apple, are contract manufacturers. So it's a global footprint. Mm -hmm. And it really allowed me to take machining um, to, 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 to that global footprint where we had factories in Singapore and China. And as a result, you know, I got to see the whole bandwidth of semiconductors from the very beginning where I'm machining the chamber for applied materials. They're putting it into a tool. They sell to Intel or Samsung. They make chips and then those chips get put into devices. And so I had the opportunity with Flex to, you know, travel throughout Asia, Japan, Korea, you know, Singapore and see, you know, just the whole gamut of how semiconductors infiltrated everything. Um, and as we came into about 2010, I really found that my niche was in business development, um, being a sales engineer and um, had the opportunity to um, do some things with Apple. Um, some things I can't go into, but one of the things was is Flex was chosen to do the Mac Pro in 2012, early 2012. And I Can lived you show your trophy? I'm sorry? Can you show your trophy? Yeah. So they gave me this plaque, which just, uh, which just shows the bottom of the Mac Pro and then a little thank you, Barry Norton, for the factory. Nice. So, you know, so you, cool. had, you had some input into the physical design of that. that yeah, I... I um, you know, I, I, I had to pinch myself because I found myself on Infinity Loop with a couple of Flextronics executives telling Apple why we could build it here in the States. So that was kind of, you know, when you're an Apple fanboy, that was kind of nirvana. Um, and we would eventually win that. And then, you know, simultaneously being with Flex, um, Amazon Echo, which was introduced, you know, 2013, 2014, but we started working on it in 2011, so I would go to Lab 126, which is right around the corner from Apple and Cupertino and deal with them, trying to put 1,520 holes into a plastic tube in under five minutes. Yeah, I, I can remember the old, uh, the old yeah. Alexa's that mm -hmm. were, they had these holes all the way around. So you had some input into that design, huh? My team figured out how we could do that in under five minutes because you had to produce these things in the millions. At the time, we could never figure out what it was they were going to do. We, we, we figured it was going to be audio of some kind, but they wouldn't tell us what it was going to do. They just had us working on proof of concept. Oh, okay. Eventually, that would all come out. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, as I did that, that just really reinforced being able to see how, you know, semiconductors work. And once I got to the factory 
in Austin when I transferred the technology from California to our factory in Austin, Texas. It was a fully enclosed factory. I think you saw Tim Cook take Donald Trump through it in a in a, in a tour when they were doing the Mac Pro. Wow. And you know, I got to hear you know you know Intel on the phone as a supplier and other other suppliers. It was just fascinating to be on the on the complete opposite end of semiconductor. Um, you know, but you know, my background in semiconductor is wafer fab equipment, so machining, right? Wafer fab equipment. So applied materials and lab research were my main customers. And when there were issues, you know, in the field, whatever, I would get called in or in my career and go into fabs and stuff and see how things work. So it just kind of, you know, I got a, I got to see semiconductor from the inside. Um, you you brushed over that pretty quick. So when there's, I think you said like opportunities for improvement, that usually means something went wrong and, and the client's blaming you and you're going to come in and figure, figure out the problem, right? Yeah. Cause you know, it is, um, yeah, you know, it, yeah, it, one of the things about, about semiconductor is you have to be able to speak a certain language. And when there's an issue in the field, um, they typically don't know exactly what the problem is. So they look at everything in and around the problem and they'll pull you in. And you better have your ducks in a row because they're going to ask you about a part and they're going to want you to provide traceability back to dirt that you did all the processes correctly. And if you did, great, they go look somewhere else. But if you didn't, then you're the one in trouble because you made a change. You mentioned yeah. something there. I just wanted to point it out when he said traceability back to dirt. So when you when the when they make something, um, you know, it, it originally came as ore out of the ground someplace. And so he, Barry wasn't exaggerating at all that every step along the way that that ore gets made into a piece of metal and then gets machined and everything is traced and tracked. It's just to give some insight into what happens. The other thing I was going to mention is, and you can talk about this problem solving stuff, is that I've always liked about you, especially in this area of technology, is that you get so deep that you can easily wave that BS flag. <laughs> yeah, you know, it is in the industry, in the semiconductor industry, Intel, obviously being the pioneer of, you know, mass producing the IC that leads back to Fairchild, but Intel created a, a methodology called copy exactly. And if you've ever been inside of a Home Depot store or a Lowe's store, you see that they have the same kind of basic footprint. That's copy exact. They duplicate. Intel duplicates everything. So once you're supplying Intel a part, you have to make that part the same way, time after time, year after year. You can't change oh. anything. And if you want to change something, you have to get approval, especially on anything around the wafer. It's called a critical part. And so if you make an uncontrolled, undocumented change in a critical part and it causes a problem in the fab, that can be huge. You could be liable for millions of dollars and get hit with what's called a copy exact violation. Yeah. And so it, it makes it very critical in the industry to make sure that you follow the proper protocols in the industry so that you don't cause those issues. I think that's where you, where you were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm going to ask a question and I, hopefully I'm not getting too far ahead, Eric, um, of what you had talked about or what you're wanting to talk about with Barry, but you know, I know your expertise, I want to try to lean this towards investing. And, you know, I know your expertise is in the semiconductor world. And, you know, a lot of people, when they look at investments, it, sometimes when you invest in your specialty, in your field, you kind of are have blinders on because of it. Or in some cases, it can make you really good at investing in your space and being able to see things that the regular investor doesn't. Where do you feel you fall in that spectrum? Do you feel it helps you or does it put, help you have blinders on? What do you think? No, I, I, think, it, I think it helps me. Um, and I think, you know, and a lot of that is, is and Eric can show it, is, is in the spreadsheet that I have. But it the research that I do keeps me focused to make sure that I'm focusing on the right areas. Um, because in semiconductor size matters. You know, a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of hype around Intel, I mean around NVIDIA and AMD, you know, two great companies. And obviously NVIDIA and what Jensen's doing there has been phenomenal. Um, and, in, and NVIDIA, you know, invented the GPU in 1999. But all that said, it's a great company but they're only doing 26 billion in revenue. And AMD is doing 23 billion in revenue. 
And in semiconductors, size matters. And when you look at, say, an Intel that's doing 63 billion in revenue, technology companies in semiconductor, they need to spend a minimum of 15% of their revenue on R&D and CapEx just to keep up. So size matters. So when you, you know, to your question, how does it relate to investing? You have to understand that, you know, Intel can spend twice as much as either NVIDIA or AMD on R&D and CapEx. And it's, that, it's those CapEx dollars that are going to drive the innovation that gets us, you know, to the promised land of, you know, sub one nanometer geometries and chips. Because not everything's figured out yet. Yeah, that's, I think, can, I don't know if I, if you, I don't want to, I know you got some ideas on how you want to do this too, Barry, but I think that's one of the most exciting things to me that you showed was this node history list that you put together. And it's, it's, it's really almost difficult to be able to conceptualize this in, in, in your mind, um, what, what exactly has happened. So Barry, important point you mentioned you said size matters, and what you're talking about is this investment in research and development that these companies are doing. And just, we've all heard about Moore's Law, right? So Moore's Law, that computing power, what's the rule? What's the Moore's Law? So in 1965, Moore, uh, Gordon Moore saw that, you know, every year and a half, the number of transistors were doubling and the cost was being cut in, in, in half. And so he coined Moore's Law, and then he revised it, he revised it in 75, saying that instead of every year and a half, it's every two years. And he only projected that to go on for maybe 10 to 15 years max, but it, it went on considerably longer. Moore's Law didn't really start to fall behind until 2005. But what's important about this is, as you see the development, um, you have to understand that with geometry, the thinner that you can make the geometry in a chip, the less energy it, it requires. It's kind of like if you plug in a, an electric heater, it generates heat by resistance on the wire. The wires get red hot. Same thing inside of a chip. And the smaller the lines are inside the chip, the less heat it generates, the less power it requires, and the mm. faster they, they can run the chip. And so if you look at the evolution of, of semiconductors, I'd never really seen anybody kind of put this kind of graph together that really shows major milestones that took place in semiconductor. And the first one was in was in 2000 was in um, 1993 and that's where you know we cut the geometry from 600 nanometers down to 350 so almost in half but we went from a 6 inch wafer to an 8 inch wafer as the mainstay in production. Um, and that was a huge you know generational shift that just made chips more abundant and that much cheaper. So these and then, wafers, and we started with two inch wafers back in the seventies, and I, I tried putting this on a graph, and it just yeah. doesn't do it justice. It, you can't, yeah. It, you can't, it, if you look at it on a graph, it's like, oh yeah, the numbers get really, really small. They get so incredibly small, it's it's almost it's it's almost hard to get the human brain. You got to put it on a logarithmic scale, and I don't think people really people really understand this, but just look at what we've done since seventy one. We've gone from something that we thought ten thousand, just whatever it was, it was ten thousand units big. And yeah. now we, here we are at, at two uh, nanometers, looking at one and knowing that we're going to get to half a nanometer. We're going to be at angstroms out here, which is at some point, Barry, we have to start thinking about the size of atoms. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, and, and, you know, when you look at 1993, when we went from the 8 inch to the 12 inch, the 12 inch wave for since 93 has been the mainstay, but we really have not had any type of quantum shift in, in, in semiconductors, they've clipped along at, as you can see, 28 to 31%. So what's this, the 12 inch wafer? So these are, this is, is this something that, I mean, the chips in my phone aren't 12 inches. So what's, what is that that's 12 inches? So the wafer itself is 12 inches in diameter. Okay. And then each individual chip is what's referred to as a die. And so you can have, you know, several thousand dies on a chip, on, on a wafer. Okay. Right? So they get cut up then? They get cut up. They, they have special saws that, that cut them up, and then they get packaged and enclosed into a housing, and then they end up in your computer or your cell phone, what have you. Okay. <clears throat> but what's important about happening is what's, what's really going to be happening in, in the next five years. 
And that is, you know, as we go down, you know, right now, kind of the, the sweet spot we're in is between five nanometer and three nanometer. You're seeing iPhones and various things of Apple and others and NVIDIA, we're at three nanometer. When we get down to one nanometer and below, that's huge because the chips become extremely fast because they're so small. It's the law of physics. There's less resistance in the chip, so they can move faster. They generate less heat, which is good. They consume less power, but the compute the, the compute power is exponential. And it's when you look at when you look at ten nanometer and seven nanometer, especially seven nanometer. Seven nanometer is what really made um, AI possible. You know, for sixty years they worked on different versions of AI, but really didn't get it until Google did it in 2017 with their Alpha Zero, where they took a number of machines from the cloud, put them together, NVIDIA GPUs and Intel chips, and taught this computer the rules of chess, and then it played 44 million rounds in 24 hours, and then that machine went out and beat all the chess champions. And that's when we really saw, okay, AI is going to be something, right? Now we've had chat GPT that was launched just last November. And we're already seeing exponential moves in chips just from chat GPT being available and people being able to use it. But now that we're in the mainstay of where AI is coming to fruition, where everybody's talking about it, in reality, AI is driving the next revolution in chips. And it's going to be revolutionary because when you look at just going from three nanometer down to one nanometer, that's 60% reduction physically in the size of the line inside the chip and that just blows my mind there uh, barry because i'm i'm thinking like i don't know from my perce per perception I, it doesn't feel like technologies i mean there's a, a chat gpt definitely move but it it's i mean we're, we're just on the cusp i mean what you're showing here is that like you think this you know you think this is fast you ain't seen nothing yet I mean, it, it, that's what the message I'm getting when I look at this data is like, if we are talking about these epic, when I look at these, you put this column in here in percent improvement, like you mentioned this in 93, that was a huge jump that happened when we went to the six and eight, but 42% improvement. I mean, we're looking at 40s, 30s, 50% improvement. That's, and how realistic is that? Intel came out um, last week and said that in 2025, um, their Xeon processor will be using what they call A18. A18 stands for 18 um, angstroms wow. or 1.8 nanometers. So they threw down the gauntlet. TSMC is already on it. Uh, IBM, people don't hear a lot about IBM, but IBM's really been kind of instrumental in the history of semiconductors, but IBM you know, has already developed uh, a two micron chip in the lab, not in production, in the lab. Wow. You know, Peter Wenick, CEO of ASML, in January, you know, he made a very poignant point in his conference call. He said it took the semiconductor industry 50 years to get to 600 billion in annual revenue. He says in the next eight years, that will double. Is that in? Is, did you put that in this chart? Is that what this? Uh, it's over on. Um, go to uh, uh, that that tab. The socks and SMH. Yeah, SMH. No, SMH. The 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 first tab. First tab. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the? Yeah. No, you want to click on uh, socks and SMH. Okay, I am. And then it it it, it messed up there. It didn't. Um, you're, you're you're covering it up. It's it's line forty six. There you go. Uh, go down line forty six. Hmm. I actually put the quote in there. Are you not seeing my? Oh yeah, it's hidden there. There you go. You see? Yeah, so, I mean that's uh, you know I'm quoting what 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 Peter said, and okay. and and Peter, ASML is 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 one of the main reasons that. You know, we've gone sub 10 nanometer because, you know, if you want to look at the semiconductor industry and say, what's the one company that if I took it away, the industry would come to a screeching halt and would not advance, that would be ASML. You take ASML out of the equation, 
and the whole industry comes to a screeching halt. Because That's they, interesting because you ask a lot of investors, and my guess is even a lot of Wall Street analysts, you know, who the biggest players and the most important names are. And I don't think ASML makes the top five. Well, yeah. it's not, but it's the Achilles heel is what you're saying, right? They're... They developed, yeah, there's a thing called lithography, which puts the mask on the wafer, right? And they make a machine called EUV, um, you know, extreme ultraviolet. And they're able to reflect a light wave down onto a chip that has a light wave of 13.5 nanometers. The current technology is 193 nanometers. Okay, so they're able to do that. And then they're coming out with what they call high and A, which is where they can develop what's called the numerical aperture, where they're improving the numerical aperture, which is the focus, their ability to focus the light to get sharper, crisper images on the wafer. They're going from 0.33 to 0.55. That's a 66% increase. That tool gets released uh, in 2024. And when they release that tool, that's going to allow... TSMC, Samsung, Micron, and Intel, the ability to go um, sub two nanometer on a wafer. So this, I don't know if it's worthwhile if you can just, you mentioned different tiers of people and, I, and other conversations I've had with you. It's interesting that I, some companies who I thought might've been competitors are not competitors. They actually work with other companies and some of these names, but some of them are competitors. So who's a, how, can you give a high level structure of like the the major roles? Who are like the tier one so suppliers? Like, or you know, and are they competitors? And then, uh, I mean, how is that market structure? So, sounds like ASML is providing anybody who's making chips. They potentially are a customer for ASML. Is that true? Yeah. So a a a a ASML is the only one in the world that does what they do. Okay. EUV lithography, everybody's tried to crack the, the code to it for the past 20 years. ASML figured out how to do it. Okay. Long lead times in ASML, um, they are inflation resistance because their lead times are over a year and their tools can cost a half a billion. Um, I mean, they're as big as a school bus. Um, nobody's going to cancel orders. So they they're and they've got a backlog. So I guess what I'm looking at, is, so you got these leading edge chip companies. So you've got AMD, Intel, Marvel. So the way the industry yeah. works is, is, is you break chips into two categories, leading edge and lagging edge. Leading edge chips are AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Intel, and Texas Instruments. Lagging edge is all of the above. I mean, these are older chips or they're larger geometry chips. Um, you know, they're not the main processors or accelerators. So you have capital equipment, which is where I was at, which is ASML, Applied Materials, LAM Research, KLA 10 Core. Those are your equipment suppliers, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you've got your foundry, which is TSMC. All they do, they are simply a foundry. Now, you folks have had some conversations with certain individuals. I think it was at Jackson Hole about TSMC and how important they are. Yeah. All yeah. Right, they are the they are the largest dedicated foundry in the world, and then when you then when you go the the next level down, now you're getting down to the chip makers, right? Samsung, Micron, Intel, they all have their own fabs. AMD, Nvidia, Qualcomm, they're they're what are called fabless, making the chips. Okay. And then once you go below them, now you're actually going to the actual device suppliers like an Apple. Apple buys their chips. Um, they design their chips, but they have their chips made by TSMC. Wow, okay. And the semiconductor market has gotten very fragmented of late. And um, I put a link in here, you know, going back to um, the former president of Stanford and chairman of the board for Google. His name is John Hennessy. He put out an 18 minute video that, 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 that talks about, you know, Moore's law is not dead. It's simply changed. And, 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 and I have friends look at it because it's, it, it, it very concisely depicts what's taking place in the semiconductor industry. It used to be Intel made a chip that was what's called the generic processor and companies didn't really understand their workloads. Now companies today understand their workloads. They know what they want to do. 
So they no longer want to go buy a chip and only use 30% of the silicon. They want to be able to go buy a chip and have it use 100% of the silicon because it's designed for a specific use. You'll hear Jensen from you know, uh, NVIDIA say that Moore's law is dead. And in a way, that's correct. But if you look at the processors that Google developed for Alpha Zero, mm -hmm. that chip was 100 times more powerful in compute than a standard Intel Xeon processor because it was designed for a very specific task. Take a tremendous amount of data and process it real time using less power. And so you're seeing now that everybody's making chips very specialized. Google makes their own chip. Facebook is working on their own chip. Apple's gone to their own chip. Everybody's making their own chip because they can, they can drive chips. They can design the software and the hardware cumulatively and get higher productivity out of their chips because they're specially designed. And so the industry has really, really taken a big turn in, in the past four or five years. I know you're an Apple fanboy. Um, so I have a, a, an Apple M1 Mac, and I, I was just blown away at how much better it is than my previous version, That, especially in battery life. The, I mean, it's just I, I've gone out of town and forgot to bring the charger with me, and I can go days without having to worry about the charge. I mean, it's, it's, I look at it and say, wait a minute, have I been charging it? No, it's like my battery is still at 70%, and I've been using it for a day. It's just crazy, and that's because they have their own chips. They're able to do that. Yes, um, you know, and so as people are designing their own chips, you know, now people are using AI to design chips. Um, you know, so you have what's called computational lithography, and that's where they can now create models and design chips and run those chips and see how they perform before they're ever built. Wow, and so it, so. Moore's law in what John Hennessy talks about in 2018, mind you, what he talks about is, yes, Moore's law, you know, at that time was about eight to nine years behind. Now it's further behind. But Moore's law has morphed into now AI has picked up the mantle. And now AI is the next Moore's law. That's the next thing. And it's just because of the power it puts in the hands of the designers and the programmers and what they can do so much more rapidly, so much more efficiently, that the moves in semiconductors are going to be exponential from what we've experienced. When you bring that down to an investing category, you know, you know, there's a lot of companies in, in SMH and SOX, the two main ETFs. But there's a reason that I only trade eight stocks and they're highlighted on my spreadsheet. Well, this is good. So now we're, I love the way that this is, this conversation is flowing and we're, uh, you know, taking it from sort of the, your background in the industry and then actually getting down into some specific names here. And so two ETFs that are popular that cover semiconductors, one is the SMH and the other is the SOX. And you've got your spreadsheet here that, that categorizes which is in which category. You've also got your, your list of equities that you trade here. And yeah, this spreadsheet is pretty interesting. Um, so this is this is a living, breathing document. Right. And if you look at the, you know, if you look at, you know, column F, and you can see that you can see AMAT, AMD, Intel, Marvell, Micron, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, TSMC, and Texas Instruments are the only companies in semiconductor I trade. And there's two reasons why. Number one, they've got significant presence and breadth of scope in their respective industry. And number two, they have options liquidity. The best example I can give is, you know, LAM Research and Applied Materials are both here in the Bay Area. They've both been my customer. I've made significant, you know, products for both of them for over 20 years. They're both great companies. They both do the same thing. LAM is focused on memory more so, where applied materials is a bigger footprint in the inside the fab and is more focused towards logic than memory. But they are the two main capital equipment suppliers in the world, right? So they mm -hmm. basically they do the same thing. And LAM has horrible options liquidity, just horrible, where applied doesn't. Well, we all know that we preach that about how important that is. And we did an episode on how important liquidity is and that you, I, I always say friends don't lend friends trade equities with poor liquidity because in the end, it's going to come back and bite you. You'll end up giving it up to the market maker. Um, you might get into a trade. Okay. But you'll probably have trouble getting out. 
and maybe you get lucky here and there and you can, you know, you can escape um, the liquidity, but it'll come back and be the reason you don't make money eventually. So it's and a good filter. Other, yeah. All the, all the other companies are great to listen to, you know, and, and I do follow them because you can see off to the right, you know, you can see the calendar January through December. And when you see a name in red, that's when they're reporting earnings, and that's when they're reporting Q4 earnings. And Q4 is very important. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I built this spreadsheet was I got frustrated with Finviz and Yahoo Finance because their PEs were never accurate, and they always gave a forward PE. And semiconductor companies are tenacious to not forecast beyond a quarter, except for when they do a Q4, they'll talk about the next year and maybe the first half versus the second half. They'll give you more color. That's why I put them in red so I can also mm -hmm. see it. And then you can see like, you know, you can see April and then you can see date in yellow. I actually put the date when those companies are going to report so I can listen to those conference calls. And I'll either listen to the conference call or I will go listen to the, to the transcript. Right. But it's, it's important to listen to all of them because you get a feel for where the industry is going. And, you know, they're all great companies and what they do, but they're just not tradable. You want to know what they're doing. They're just right. if you want to be able to, you know, have long stock and, you know, trade options around it as, as a hedge tool and or have other trades, you've got to have the liquidity. So it's, it's not uncommon for me to have three or four trades on for AMAT, for you know, you know AMD, NVIDIA. I've had a couple of different trades. Micron in one account, I'm long and it's collar. In another, I was just, you know, flat out, you know, selling in the money puts, you know, the next day when it spiked. So, uh, um, just on the on the conference calls, I mean, you listen all the way through. I know you listen to the analyst calls. I know sometimes when I listen to the analyst questions and I, makes me scratch my head because I think sometimes what you said here is you listen to the conference calls of companies you're not trading. Why do you do that? And that's because you're going to get some market insight or maybe some insight into, you know, if it's affecting this business, it's going to affect that business. And sometimes those analyst questions, you know, straight up, they, they don't really care about you. They're wondering, you know, what's the impact to the, to the market? Uh, because sometimes, you know, there may be something like a supplier, maybe, to one of these leading edge companies might, you know, be forecasting a reduction in sales. And that might tell us that, hey, maybe these other companies are are seeing some weakness or something, right? Is it is that the sort of stuff you're getting out of it? Yeah, because you know, they're they're usually pretty good not to talk about their competitors, but yeah, the conference call is really broken up into three sections, right? It's the what I call the CEO sales pitch, then the CFO numbers, then you get to the QA. And the QA is so important because. You know, I listen for things like, you know, these guys know each other. So it's, hey, congratulations, great numbers. Or do they go right into their question? Or is there angst in their question because they're frustrated or mad of, of what they're hearing? Yeah, and those can be very I, I got to agree with you. Because you listen, I, I mean, I'll read the transcript as well. But hearing the questions and hearing that great quarter guys, right? So yeah. like sometimes I'm not sure it was good. But if you hear great quarter guys, congratulations. But sometimes they steamroll right past that. And you can actually hear the animosity in the questions and especially some of the responses, depending on who it is. And you can get a feel for the personalities of people. So I do uh, listen, listen to the shareholder calls myself. In a way, it's similar uh, listening to a Fed press release, right? You know, when, <laughs> when Jerome Powell releases his, his report, you don't really care about what the actual number is or the statement. It's the questions afterwards when he does the press conference that you really get the market moving stance of what the Federal Reserve is doing. So, yeah, it's the same, same thing true in the earnings report. Like you knew that NVIDIA was going to be up the next day because there were so many questions they could have asked about delinquencies and the validity of the inventory write offs, whether they had to take a charge for it, if it was still viable. I mean, there's so many things they could have asked, but every question was about AI. AI, AI, AI. How many times was AI mentioned on the NVIDIA call? I, I lost count at, at like 41 <laughs> in terms of a question. So yeah, it, it. But NVIDIA is definitely when people think of a company, I, I don't know everything I read and maybe you can comment on this, but you know, everything, if I want to play AI, everybody's NVIDIA is the company, right? Why is that? Or is that true? And why? Why NVIDIA? I, I think that's hype. Um, NVIDIA definitely is, is an industry leader. Um, 
in what they call you know accelerators and chips uh, i'm not going to begrudge them one but it's amazing what they've done but you know there's no one company that's going to be able to monopolize ai they're going to have peaks and valleys you know um and that's why i say size matters you know everybody's down on intel i'm not down on intel um, people have forgotten about Intel, but if, if you look at the history of Intel and the CEOs they had, they went through a period where, you know, after the founders were gone, they put in this guy named Paul Ottolini. He was the first non-technical guy. Then they had another guy kicked out who was, you know, Bob Kuiznik, you know, who got thrown out for inappropriate reasons, you know, inappropriate conduct. You know, then you had Bob Swain and he was fired. Then they finally brought in, you know, Pat you know, Gieselinger back in 2021. This is the guy that designed the 486 chip when he was with um, Intel earlier in his career and then went to VMware and had a very successful career. So this is a guy that speaks semi and understands semi. And he's he's doing a phenomenal job. Of, of turning the company around and driving the right culture that needs to be back at Intel because they definitely lost their way. Um, most folks will tell you that it was a decade of management at Intel that caused them to lose the race with TSMC back in 2018. So you've got Qualcomm. Qualcomm has a chip that beat, um, that beat one of NVIDIA's H100 chips. When you look at chips and you say, okay, how many servers can it ping per watt? Qualcomm was 197, and NVIDIA was 103. And the number of pings that a, uh, an AI chip can ping is huge because that's how much energy it's gonna consume. So yes, NVIDIA is important, but so is Qualcomm, so is Intel. Intel just gave a, 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 an investor day last week that was phenomenal that talked about the wins they have. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about how, you know, companies don't want to, you know, buy silicon that they don't need. They want things that are specialized, you know, and so there's a whole host of chips that people are making that give very specialized focus to these customers. And I think NVIDIA is going to be one of the winners. So is AMD, but it's going to be pretty much the top eight that I trade are going to be winners in AI. So yeah. they'll all, they'll all have their you know, where they do this and this will happen. Sort but. of related to this conversation though, we, we talked a little bit before we hit the record button. You mentioned something about um, something we heard on one of our favorite podcasts, the All In podcast with Jason Calacanis and um, his three other buddies, um, but he's the great moderator, right? Uh, but you were talking about an anecdote that we heard or that you heard about um, AI and computing processing, which made me think of a, I, I'm, I'm just thinking off the cuff here. Um, we were talking about the difference between chat GPT and, uh, and Google's Bard. And what was the anecdote you were sharing about CPU? Yeah, I think it was Chad that said it, that you know when you look at compute, it was taking chat GPT 30 cents to present a query to a customer on the screen where Google was like two and a half cents. So it was a magnitude of, 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 of cost. And as, and as he said, as we rise the compute curve and cheap energy curve, meaning chips re require less energy so power gets cheaper, you know, that gap is going to close. And as Greg spoke earlier in this conversation, you got to wonder what a chat GPT and AI does to the various search models we have now. Because as we get stronger in compute power, AI is only going to exponentially drive the industry. And that's why, you know, I go back to what the ASML said, you know, in the next eight years, the industry is going to double. Wow. And as it doubled, that means huge opportunities for us because, um, you know, the, the semiconductor is a very small family. Um, you know, there's just 25 members in SMH. And I think it is the better ETF. It was developed, I think, in 2011 is when it came to fruition. But it really, it, it really focuses on all of the key components within semiconductor. And then drop. The do, do you trade SMH or SOX? How's the liquidity for those ETFs? I don't. I, um, you know, I've not really looked at that. I just, um, I like to be more specialized because it's just. 
when I'm trading SMH, I'm trading the effects of all of them. And, you know, when you look at SMH, you know, TSMC is, is one of the major players the last time I looked in terms of percentages. And it's just, you know, I'm kind of playing a hodgepodge. So I've just seemed to do better with the, um, and it's just my trading style because typically when I'm trading, you know, one of my secondary exits, I leave a primary or a secondary exit is to take ownership. So, yeah, so as we, what Barry's talking about now is we at Options Animal believe that if, if there's one thing that you all can do to be a better trader, and that is to have a clear, defined trading plan. So when do I close close my trade for a profit? And what do I do if that doesn't happen? Um, that's So the secondary exit is if you you're, what you hope happens doesn't. Uh, what are you going to do? And a common secondary exit could be for some people is to take ownership of shares um, and turn it into some sort of collar trader cover call. Yeah, I don't remember which instructor it was, whether it was you, Eric, or Greg, or Karen, or Charin. Um, but one of you talked about, you know, it could even been been Jeff, you know, Jeff, because Jeff trades, you know, you know, American Airlines over and over and over. And it was just, you know, the thing I learned from Options Animal is learn your stock and trade it over and over and over. You don't need to do, you know, searches and scan the next hot stock. Just know your stocks and trade them specifically. And so that's what I do. Because you don't need the stock to go. I mean, we have more tools than just buying stock, yeah. make money in a stagnant trend. I mean, for the longest time in Intel, you know, for a good number of years, Intel stayed within a $20 range between 40 and 60. And so in my 401k, I would sell a three-month call owning the stock, collect the dividend, get 275 for the option was maybe 50 cents out of the money. And I could make five or 6% every three months. And if I got called away, then I would just, you know, do a put strategy to put me back into the stock. This is a five-year chart of Intel here. So I, I'm looking at the, the one-year chart. Um, I mean, it looks like, I don't know. I see something like this. Here we we had put in this base in here with level of support, and then we had some resistance somewhere around the the moderate uh, 30s, and we've broken above that. We challenged it a couple of times, but then we got a you know solid close above it. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I think that's interesting. PE at 16.8, that's pretty low for tech. But you know, I, I it's not just about stock charts or just looking at the fundamentals. There's more than that. What this company does matters. And you hit on something that was a pet peeve of mine too, and that is, I remember Intel um, going to look at their um, going to Edgar.com or .gov and reading the the 10K, and it was this looked like this glossy ad that was when you read the description of what they do. They was something like, oh, we add value to people by you know improving the quality globally of you know, through innovation and like what the hell do you do like it's just a bunch of bs it's like yeah. it's all marketing fluff that was yeah that was there that was the under the ceo that was a marketing guy and that yeah. was a mistake i mean yeah. I, there's no need for the 10k to be uh to be to have that kind of fluff and it. it's not marketing and it's just it's a real pet peeve of mine when i see that it's a to me, it has the opposite effect of what they want. They're trying to impress me, but I'm like, this is a company I want to sell. Um, and they still haven't quite got away from that. They still have their glossy, uh, but they are definitely. Um, Intel has not had, in my opinion, Intel has not gotten back to their roots in terms of leadership since 2005. And I think Pat's doing a great job. I mean, he got Sapphire Lakes out ahead of schedule. And there's a reason that NVIDIA chose Xeon, Zen, Xeon Gen 4, Intel Xeon processor, as their lead node for their um, uh, H100 GPU. I, I mean, just, I have no idea what you just said. Was that English? <laughs> <laughs> so I, what it means is that, you know, what nvidia does is accelerate compute through a combination of, of computers that are called nodes as they bring them together and combine them to do something um they chose intel to drive that that activity on the front end so nvidia so is using statement. intel technology they're using intel technology that's a statement yeah a, so i have a question that's i want to take a step back and ask a broader question i know you listened to the, you already referenced it earlier, the, the conversation that Eric and I had this last summer out in Jackson Hole. 
uh, with a, a number of people um, talking about the geopolitical risks surrounding semiconductors right now. And you know, I, I, the, the conversation that rings a bell to me was actually a, one of the partners at Bain Capital was called into the White House, was asked by Secret then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, how quickly can we onshore all of the United States' semiconductor technologies? And he said, uh, he said 20 years is what the, 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 the partner at Bain told him. He said it would take forever. Um, and, you know, Pompeo said, we need it done in three. Uh, do you see that move continuing? I mean, I don't know if how much of that was in relation to, you know, the Trump administration and their relationship with China versus the Biden's administration and their relationship to China. But do you see political risks right now? And are certain companies more exposed maybe to some of those political risks? Particularly, I guess, Taiwan, I assume Taiwan Semi is probably right at the center of it. But what are your thoughts on that? Is it something that you look at and something we need to be looking at as well going forward? Yeah, I, you know, so, you know, I have obviously friends here in the Valley and the industry that work at, you know, virtually all the companies that I trade. And, um, you know, so we have conversations about that. You know, and there is a note of concern, you know, TSMC, you know, you guys talked about it one time, had someone tell you it's the crown jewel. And in a sense, it is. TSMC produces 60% of the world's leading edge chips. Wow. So, you know, NVIDIA uses TSMC and Samsung. Apple uses TSMC. AMD uses TSMC. Intel is going to TSMC to help them bridge their own manufacturing. And so when you listen to the conference calls now, because of what you spoke about, Greg, there is a, a, a force of, you know, nationalization now where companies want to, you know, kind of nationalize their semiconductor manufacturing. You know, ASML, the one company said, if you take them out, you're toast. You know, they're in the Netherlands, right? And there was concern that maybe they would still provide their next generation machines to China, which would give them the capability to go sub seven nanometer. And they came out and said, they're not going to do that. They're going to honor, you know, the restrictions that, you know, the other countries are putting on China. Um, but it, it, it's, it's still something you can't ignore. It's very hard for me personally to fathom that, you know, the saber rattling we hear on TV and then the media about China invading Taiwan because Taiwan is an island. And I mean, they're, they're an island in terms of semiconductor manufacturing. They need applied materials and LAM research. They need other companies in the U.S. and around the world to help them do what they do. And at the point that China invades Taiwan and takes over the crown jewel, you know, the world's just not going to supply them, it, it will cause a huge disruption. And it just makes it very hard for me to fathom that could happen. Um, but people do talk about it, and, and it is definitely a concern. But in a sense, bank capital was right. You know, it, it costs north of three and a half, four billion to build a fab from the moment you break ground. And it's upwards of, of, you know, five to 10 million, depending upon what you're doing. That's why the chip back at 50 billion is, for me personally, it's a joke. Let's talk more about the chip back then. First of all, what is it? What was it supposed to be? And what do you think it is? Well, they're, they're you know, they're supposed to be providing funds and, and tax incentives, you know, to build manufacturing, some kind of manufacturing here in the U.S., but it, it, it has restrictions as to what companies can and can't do financially in terms of buying back shares and things like that, that they may not want to do it. And, you know, when you look at an Intel or take TSMC, the, the leader in revenue right now, you know, those guys are spending, you know, 20 billion a year, just them on CapEx to build fabs. You know, you throw in a Micron, a Samsung, an Intel, um, and a few others, uh, global foundries, you know, that, 
you know, the government, if they really wanted to do a chip act, it should have been maybe half a trillion. <laughs> I mean, since we're throwing away so much money, that would have made sense, right? I'll drone power. Hey, get those printers going. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this isn't easy. I mean, it's it's like, you know, I remember one time, you know, Texas Instruments, you know, one of the things that's unique about it, the industry is Texas Instruments, 1930 Intel, 1960s. A, uh, applied Materials, 1960s, you know, Micron, um, 19, uh, late 70s. You've got some companies that have been around for a long time. Texas Instruments has chips that they make today that they've made for the past 30 years that are still used, ironically, right? Um, and those recipes are so hard to duplicate. It, that's the challenge is making chips is not easy. It is there, you know, Semiconductor tools are the most highly engineered, highly configurable products in the world. I don't know of anything that is more highly configured because everybody has their own recipe. Google has their recipe for their chip. NVIDIA has their recipe. Intel has their recipe. You have all these different recipes. It's amazing what TSMC can do to manage all of those recipes, you know, when they're, you know, doing, you know, millions and millions of wafers a year. So to think they can bring that to the U.S. in three to five years is, is absolutely absurd. And, you know, it does bring cause for geopolitical concerns, because if there are disruptions anywhere in the world, you could bring the industry to it, to it, to it, to its knees. You could bring it to a halt. You take out TSMC, you don't have iPhones. You take out ASML, the Internet of Things comes to a complete halt. Um, you take out Applied Materials and LAM Research, the two main tool suppliers, you're going to have a hard time making wafers. You take out KLA 10 core, you're not going to be able to expect anything. You, you know, you take out Qualcomm, there's another, um, there, there's another aspect of mobile and digital that goes bye-bye. Um, Texas Instruments, if you take them out, you know, you can sell a chip from, you can buy a chip from NVIDIA and put it into a device, but if you don't have all the back-end lagging edge chips to go along with it, those products won't come to market. So it's a very, very fragile supply chain. Hmm. I don't know that necessarily Washington understands just how fragile and how unique it is. Ben, and how ben Hunt did a, I don't know if you are fans of Dune. I, I know Greg is because he likes all sort of sci-fi. You like Dune, Greg, right? Yeah. I, you yeah. know what? I actually haven't seen the movie yet. But you've read the book. You I've read the, the book. I've read yeah, the book. Or books. So uh, Ben Hunt um, refers to Taiwan Semiconductor or Taiwan as Arrakis. So in yeah. this future universe, um, Arrakis is this desert planet that has these, it's really inhospitable place. And it's got these worms that are the size of, you know, I don't know, they're, they're giant, they're huge and they go eat people. And, uh, but the, it produces this spice and nobody's really sure how the spices produces. It has, the, has to do with the worms. Um and, hey, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Yeah, Those spoiler alert. It has to do with the words. <laughs> uh, but uh, D Dune's a fantastic book, great sci-fi series, great movie. But uh, the whole universe needs this spice that's produced uh, because of its its effects that, uh, that allows people to navigate. And it's the reason they can do it. So without Arrakis, without the spice, and there's this the saying, the spice must flow. And so uh, it's very politically contentious. And his story... Um, is you know a great parallel because Taiwan and the the spice must flow and without Taiwan without Taiwan semiconductor uh, everything goes down so it is something that gets a lot of attention I fortunately I think um, speaking to people outside the U S uh, especially that there's a there's a lot more hope although I don't know we're gonna go see Jonathan Ward he wrote uh, China's vision of victory. And he's got a new book out. Um, Greg and I are going to see him in a few weeks. Maybe we get him on here to talk about his new book. China's uh, scary. About... I'm sorry, that... go ahead. No, I was going to say China scares you because they work on a 50-year plan while we work on a on a four-year plan. A four-year plan, if that. Oh, it's a two-year plan and two years. Well, it's a four-year plan, but two of those years are how I get reelected. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, you got to put the election cycle in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, exactly. So China's strategy is is interesting, and it's something to keep an eye on. But I mean, it, I I freaked out when I started when I came back from Jackson Hole. Um, I was I was a little bit panicked. Um, 
because uh, what's I was happen? panicked. Well, you guys, I mean, I won't repeat the names and stuff, but it, but you, yeah, it, what you guys told me is I went like, oh no, this is wow. Um, it's definitely on the radar. You know, one thing I'm I'm a hundred percent certain of there's there's the news, and then there's what we get to talk about. There's stuff that could seem to consume the zeitgeist, and we all get fired up about what kind of beer people are drinking or who's picture is on the cover of you know whatever advertisement and that's gonna everybody's gonna focus on that but this other stuff that's going on with uh with uh you know monetary policy and the m1 money supply and what's happening in china and taiwan don't worry about that what's happening in the ukraine uh, you know the, the headlines are very curated as to what we get to see and worry about so um but that's okay the people who are in power They've got our best interest in mind, and so the central planners. <laughs> so, I mean, at least you know, at least they have some of the right thinking. You know, back to Greg's question. You know, there there is discussion about you know building plants in Europe and building more plants in the U.S. and maybe Mexico. Those are all, you know, positive steps. I think that we are too centric in in in, in Asia as it is because it just the logistical problems you know, make it very challenging, especially when you throw on top of that the geopolitical. So I think diversification is good. And more so, what TSMC has done is is nothing short of phenomenal. I mean, these guys, for a number of years, did what was called half note increments, to where, you know, you know, in Intel, maybe they went 28, and then 22, and then 14. You know, when TSMC got to around 12, I think when they said, you know, we're going to do 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, and so, you know, you'll talk about five nanometer and three nanometer, but they're also supplying four nanometer chips to, to their customers. They do these half node increments. So every year they're driving the technology down. What they've done is, is truly amazing. It's really a phenomenal company. I, I've been just amazed at what they've done in, in their technology. And they're very, you know, they're very forthcoming with their technology also. They're very good at, you know, providing seminars and investor days and symposiums and stuff that you can actually go to and, and really hear them talk about what they're doing. They know they've got the lead. They know it's going to be very challenging for anybody to catch them. I, I, I think maybe Intel has a shot, but um, it's definitely going to take some work from everybody else to keep up with those boys. So but timely politics back the way just to, to change subject real quick uh or go back to what we were just talking about speaker mccarthy it actually met with president side and when uh today the president of taiwan which is you know we um nancy pelosi went over and new speaker kevin mccarthy which um despite saber rattling from the chinese communist regime so here we are continuing to kick China in the shins uh, over Taiwan. So it'd be something to keep, it's very interesting. And here, I think this is probably the biggest reason why we care about Taiwan. I'm not, there's probably other reasons to care, uh, but losing Temi, uh, Taiwan semiconductor. Um, um, if not, I, I assume that if China had control over it, they'd still let them make chips for everybody else. But um, this is why it's so important. Yeah, you know, I I I talk with with people in the valley, and, and and everybody has concerns about it, and and I know that it trickles down from the executives. They have concerns, and then there's this other part of them that just says it wouldn't make any sense for them to do it because we're so intertwined in the supply chain. They would get a car that would eventually run out of gas. Is basically what what what, what I was told. Wow. Yeah, they can steal the car, but you know, and hopefully it has a full gas tank. Because, but sooner or later, yeah, because Tia Taiwan Semiconductor not only needs everybody else. I mean, everybody needs Taiwan Semiconductor, but it's the other way around. They they need other people too. So that's the the picture you painted is this this really tightly woven uh, supply chain with all these. You go parts. out and you buy a new car. You need brakes and tires eventually, right? You buy a tool from Applied Materials. You have to re every now and then you've got to do a PM preventative maintenance, and you've got to refurb certain parts. You need new parts for that tool to keep the. There are parts inside of a chamber that makes a wafer that have a life cycle, and it's you know, applied materials in their spares business has done a phenomenal job with spares where, when they sell a tool, they have their customers sign up to a subscription based model where they're. They're, you know, getting regular money and then applied supplies them all the parts and stuff. TSMC is is on that model. So 
you know, China can maybe run for three or four months, but they don't have the spare parts. Those tools aren't going to work anymore, and they're not going to get the yields. That makes I, sense. Yeah, it's, that's why it's just so hard to fathom it, it could happen. But, you know, I'm not that smart. <laughs> so let's um, let's talk about some of the maybe from uh, individual stocks or what are some of the other things that you look at here? Um, you've got you shared the earnings dates, which and the reds being so, the so, so drop down a little bit just on um, just on the spreadsheet. You can go down a little bit lower. So stop right there. That, that, that's a good that's a good spot. So the crux of what I do. Oh no, go back up a, 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 a little bit. So the crux of what I do is um, I, I've, I've tried to make my research as expositious as possible. So I've put links to all of the investor websites of, of all the companies in both SOX and SMH. And that way I can just click on them and very quickly see if they have any news they put out or if there's upcoming events that I can attend or past events that maybe I missed that I can watch. So it makes it very easy just to click through that. And I can typically do that in about 20, 25 minutes. So let me pause here because this is one of the points that I, I mentioned at the beginning is benchmarking what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So putting in the homework to actually go look at the investor relation, something we strongly suggest people do is mm -hmm. go to, if there's a company that's your core that you, you're going to trade, they're on your watch list, something you primarily trade, go to the investor's website, sign up for the emails and the alerts, and you, and you need to be checking. You notice, you saw here this calendar that, um, that Barry keeps a list of knows when the earnings calls are coming, but there's also other important events and he has the links here to that. Right. And then two companies that are not in, um, are not in SMH or SOX is i and um, UCTT or Ultra Clean Technologies. And um, I actually used to run a factory for UCT, um, their San Francisco factory for, for a number of years. So I know the company very well, but these two companies, they are tier one suppliers to, um, to um, uh, apply materials and lamb research. And so, you know, one of the easiest ways, even if I didn't have friends inside these companies, if I want to know the semiconductor industry is ramping, all I have to do is on a Saturday drive by their parking lot and see if there are cars in the parking lot. Channel checks. Channel check. The old P the old Peter Lynch channel check. Right there. Exactly. The old walk on Wall Street Peter Lynch. And 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 um and it's really that simple. Um, because these guys, you know, the lead time, you know. Applied materials and lamb research, they depend upon a mill like Alcoa or Kaiser to give to, you know, give their suppliers aluminum. And, and those those lead times are six months. So if applied materials and lamb research are, are going to ramp up because TSMC and Intel and Samsung are ordering tools, well, they're going to go to these guys and place orders and other tier one suppliers. And then they're going to place orders. And so you can see around the Bay Area when you know things are ramping. You know, people are working um, overtime um, on weekends, and you can see it, and it's a great channel check. Um, and then the other thing is the research. And a lot of what I see on TV is I, I question, you know, there's reason. You know, if you watch CNBC, my TV stays off during the day because that's just entertainment. It's not real news. What the company says, that's news. They have to tell the truth. If they don't, they go to jail. Yeah. So, you know, no one better than, you know, the CEO telling you what he is and isn't doing. But if you want to learn industry trends, and I've put, you know, several sites that I go to that are extremely informative to the extent you want to get geeky about semiconductor and understanding what's, what's happening. And, um, and one of the newest well, that was the link you mentioned earlier, the the one from John Hennessy, the YouTube, yes. the end of Moore's Law, as we know it. That's that YouTube links there. We'll put these these links down here in the bottom of the chat. I don't know. I guess we could probably put all of these in here. Um, yeah, you can. There's no pride of authorship. You're more than happy to to share those however you like. I, I you know, for me, it's a living, breathing document. You know, I go in every month and I put in the dates of when the company is going to be reporting because FinViz is not accurate. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it told me Qualcomm was, you know, going to be in, in April and actually they're reporting like May, May 3rd. So I, I make those adjustments as I go on. But I actually ping these sites for information on a regular basis to read articles, to listen to podcasts and things just to kind of keep, you know, my finger on the pulse of what I'm interested in. And what I'm interested in is, is any trends or changes or thinking that will drive the eight companies that I trade. And the latest one um, is ChatGPT, and it has been, um, I would say, revolutionary in, in research that I do because, as we were talking earlier, you know, while its training stops at 2021, and the next version will maybe be 2022 or 2023, still its ability to, you know, disseminate information about semiconductor is 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 pretty impressive. You know, like I asked it. You know, what were the major, you know, con uh, contributions that IBM did to the semiconductor industry? And it labeled all that. I asked it, okay, you know, inside of a semiconductor, there's metal that connects all of the devices, the diodes, the transistors, what have you. And I said, can you tell me about Interconnect, you know, 3.0? And it labeled all of the various materials that are being evaluated, you know, for the next generation semiconductor chip. And so... You know, all the ones above, if there's something you don't understand, rather than going to, to Google, you can go to chat GPT and ask the question. It will give you a very good synopsis. So it's, that's why I've included it in my research. Well, one of the things that I, I mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm using chat GPT for is I get these really long articles that hmm. people say, oh, read this. It's great. And I'm, I, I, I don't know how people have time to read a 13,000. There was something from Matt Taibbi that several people had said, oh, this is great. You need to read it. 13,000 words. So I just put a link into chat GPT and then it gave me a couple paragraphs and said, Hey, here's what's important about this. And, um, and then, you know, certainly helps if you do want to read it and dive down to it. I, I thought that summarize feature is a really good. So I'll just summarize this um, is a really good uh, use case. I'm sure more and more are going to keep coming up, but that's one I've been liking. One of the more fascinating conversations I've had about um Chat GPT was with a friend of mine who's a professor uh, at the university here in uh, in Rexburg, and his you know the the thing that the initial concern was that most school people brought up is you know the, the fear of plagiarism right you know have students going to have Chat B, Chat GPT go write their their master's thesis or whatever it might be and I'm sure there's some of that that does go on. Um, but he took the other angle with it, and, and it's more along the lines of what you're saying, Barry, to help do research. He said, this is going to help students learn. I mean, it's going to be able to allow them, you know, in the past to learn things. You know, you'd have to go to the library and find books. And even with Google, you know, you do research and it's not very focused. You have to really sometimes dig really hard to get really true in-depth research. And what ChatGPT is going to help these in, in his opinion, and he thinks more teachers, more professors need to embrace AI because he feels like it will help humans actually become smarter, not dumber. I know that's the concern that a lot of people are having with AI is like, okay, at what point does Arnold show up out of a cloud and, you know, come back from the future to try to kill whoever invented chat GPT? Maybe it's Sakatoshi Nakamura. What's the guy's name that made Bitcoin? I don't know his name. I don't know. Yeah. Satoshi. <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> Satoshi. There you go. Yeah. No, anyway, yeah. I, I think it was a fascinating conversation about there, there are enormous uses for AI uh, that I don't even think we've talked about. I mean, I really do believe what a lot of the uh, fans and, and people who are pushing AI are talking about that. I think it's, this is going to change society as much or more than the internet did back in the the late 80s, early 90s, when the internet first started to come on stage. Greg, you're wrong, because I don't know if you saw the op-ed by Krugman. He says it's not going to have much of an effect. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, I'm I did not. not. Joking. He I wants to bat joking. 0 for 2. Krugman is the guy who said yeah. that that the internet was going to have the same impact as the fax machine. And he's got a piece out saying that Why <laughs> somebody posted on Twitter, this Krugman's piece saying that it's not going to have much of an impact. And somebody responded, now I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, Paul. Yeah, you go, listen, prize. You, you go listen to that video from John Hennessy, and, and he very concisely and eloquently tells you that he he agrees with exactly what Jeff just said. And and I've done the Greg. nerd. Greg. Oh. No, go on. You and, I've done the, and I've done the nerdy deep dive on 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 what AI is going to do. And um, you know, semiconductors are the new, you know, you know, oil, you know, oil was discovered in what 1857 in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And you know, from then on, we just took off. Um, you know, what we're experiencing is on par with that. This is bigger than the internet, it's bigger than the iPhone because it is going to affect every portion of our life because semiconductors are going to be everywhere. You know, the edge computing is sensors and information and data everywhere. And as that, you know, gets in, get, gets the installed base increase, it just becomes exponential. And what I've seen it's going to do for chips is, is I didn't realize a year ago that it was going to be AI that, that got us to one nanometer and beyond. I, I, always told people it's going to be new materials. You know, they're going to develop new materials that have a higher dielectric, insulative, and conductive properties. And that's what was going to do it. Mm -hmm. Never did I say it was going to be AI. And now when I look at what they can do with modeling and, you know, uh, what they call, you know, interim AI, which is the ability to take large models, large, vast amounts of data and compute it very rapidly for real time. How that's going to drive semiconductors is 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 exponential, and it's not something that was in my vocabulary a year ago. And now, you know, I've been doing the research for about three months. It's like, okay, I get it. Wow, this is bigger than I thought it was going to be. Well, let me ask you a question. So, you know, speaking of, I mean, this is one of the things that excited me. I was really looking forward to talking to you about this. But I mean, we're on the cusp of some major stuff. Uh, who? Who benefits out of this list? Is this uh, all ships rise with the tide? Is there are there one particular company everybody wants? You know, who do I buy? Um, and and the answer is not. You know, I, I I don't really do. I don't think people do a great job picking stocks. But um, somebody's going to be a winner here, or is it going to be the whole sector? Or um, what what are your thoughts there? It is it is going to be the whole sector. Okay because everybody is going to benefit from it. Because as you go lower in geometries where you're literally lining up atoms in line widths, um, you know, if you've got a chip that's based on three nanometer and you can get a chip that's based on one nanometer, you know, one of the biggest variable costs for a data center is electricity. The power to run the, to run the plant and the power to, to, to run the cooling, right? You need the power. For the machines and you need the power for the cooling and if you can get chips that create less heat and you need less cooling if you have computers that can use less power again energy becomes cheaper so you're going to want to retrofit your fat your data centers and get rid of the three nanometer and get the one nanometer or the sub nanometer right and as a result that you're going to need different equipment to build those tools right mm. so you want the machines from asml you're going to want the machines from applied materials and lamb research Right. You're going to need to buy chips from Texas Instruments. You're going to buy chips from, you're going to go to TSMC. Right. You're going to go to, so you can't really say there's going to be one winner, but what you have to do is, is get a sixth sense to understand that, okay, NVIDIA is going to be an outlier and run, right? And Intel is going to go through problems and it's going to be challenged. AMD is going to be in the middle. You know, NVIDIA right now, I'm not saying anything against it, but you know, it earned a dollar seventy six, and when it did that two years ago, the stock was, I think, at one thirty nine. Look where it's at today, the earning of one fifty four. I mean, like, come on, that's crazy. Yeah, so I, you know, it's like Nvidia is running purely on AI hype. What they can do in the future, you know, Intel just had a nice run. Um, you know, so we've got a little bit extended, but you know, those are just short term aberrations that. Thank you, Options Animal. I have the opportunity to trade around. But I mean, in terms of, of the long term, it's it's going to be a sea that raises all boats. You can't, it's just, when you say the industry is going to double, you pretty much can see it's these companies that have to double. These are the companies that are going to double. These are the ones that are going to see the increase in business as a result of new technology. 
you know, looking at your list here, and I mean, the, if you got a, the high PE companies are expensive. That's what that's what high P, price price to earnings. Right. And it's funny as I, I listened to you, and just today, I I was I think it was Bloomberg's like somebody asking the question, how do we take advantage of this Chat GPT, this generational AI thing? And, and you know the answer. And it, they said buy Nvidia. Like, what's your thoughts there? Is it, I guess I know the answer already. I know the answer, but. Yeah, you know, I, you know, it's it's very hard for me to be. There's part of me that really wants to be exponentially bullish on on semi and go all in. Um, but like it's I not said, Nvidia. It's probably not the right. Well, it, it, it's it's very hard for me to see how, with where our economy is at, what we know the Fed is doing, what they're trying to do with the economy. You know, it is, you know, how are these companies going to be able to thrive? You know, in this you know, backdrop of recession looming and what effects do that? Is it a soft landing? I mean, we don't know, right? I mean, we we have our educated guesses. The one thing that you can know about Semiconductor is that NVIDIA and, and all of those companies, they're not investing for next, next quarter. They're investing for the next three to five years. Mm. And they have to. It's just like a builder when he builds homes because it takes him so long to get permits and regulations and all that put through, he might get rid of his weaker tracks, but he's gonna, he's still gonna continue to build. He has to keep building. Same thing in some microduct. You have to keep investing, even though there may be a recession. Yes, Micron, you know, cut their CapEx because of a short-term aberration, but they didn't kill it entirely. And other companies are still spending money. So they're still gonna spend the money. Semiconductor companies use downturns to retool and get ready for the next ramp. It used to be that semiconductors, you know, back when I got into the industry, applied materials would revenue a tool in a year, maybe a year and a half. And so all the companies would overorder. And then when they got too much inventory and things slowed down, they'd cancel the orders and we'd see these big swings, these big gyrations. And that was a cyclical uh, uh, business in semiconductor. But now you've got, you know, like the CEO Dickerson for a applied materials comes out and goes, we know we're no longer in a cyclical industry. We are in a secular industry. So there always has to be enough investment to keep to keep the evolution going. You know, if they stop investing today, then you know Intel's, you know, uh, you know, 1.8 nanometer doesn't happen in 2025. They've got to spend today for that to happen. So there's always going to be a spend. It's just at what level and what velocity does it happen? Um, hmm. but I think in the short term, I think, you know, they're a little bit extended with what the economy is going to do. You know, maybe they come in a little bit, right? And, and, and the, probably well, they should. I mean, look at what NVIDIA has done since last October. And, and what's the reason for that? They had a terrible conference call. They had a hype on AI, but you know, the numbers weren't that great. It's not like they're predicting, you know, the revenue was down, the earnings were down. AMD, same thing. Like I said, the only one that's insulated completely is ASML because they can't make their tools fast enough. Hmm. Good to be them, huh? Good to be them. Too bad they've got terrible options liquidity. <laughs> ASML, yeah. Well, you but I mean, talk much about, I mean, oh, Karen, uh, oh, Karen loves. Uh, I love Karen. Yeah, she's Miss AMD, and she's just. Yeah, I love listening to her, and I love hearing your thoughts. You know that what 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 AMD did is, um, I, I really admire what they did because they expanded their footprint beyond just being a processor company trying to fight. Intel, which is for the longest time, they were always second fiddle. Mm -hmm. um, they went and bought Xilinx, which gave them FPGAs, which means that, you know, field programmable uh, arrays that now, you know, they've got a whole new market to play ball in. Um, and they and Intel are the two big boys in that field. And, you know, I get a kick out of analysts that, you know, ignore that aspect of Intel's business when just last week, Intel said point blank, you know, when it comes to FPGAs, we've won all of the major sockets over the past several years, which means they've, since they've had, you know, Altel since 2015, 
you know, they've got a very strong foothold in that market. And that's one of the chips that you can buy, that you can, you know, consume the majority of the silicon. You're not buying a process that are only going to use 30%. So these are huge going forward for AI and driving these engines. So well, Barry, you give us a lot, and I want to be respectful of your time because I could, I would love to just hang out here for a few more hours. This is turning into like a Joe Rogan or a, uh, uh, Lex Friedman <laughs> podcast that go on for three hours, and I don't want to do that. But I'm going to tell you what I'm just looking at this and and just uh, you know sometimes uh, you know the right, the right process of you know, finding up a, a trade you know starting with due diligence. But you know two things sort of came to mind here, and I'm just I I don't know if you I don't want you to I want to know I do want to have an idea of what you're trading, what strategies you're looking at, but. Just a couple of ideas. When I look at this one, this is a five-year chart on Intel. Um, my thought is if I want to buy Intel and the PE is low, you know, it looks like it's broke out recently, but you know, maybe this is from from my perspective, is look at look at this maybe as a potential bullish candidate, maybe something with uh put credit spread or something and taking ownership as a secondary exit, maybe a calendar trade or a diagonal trade might work. That's one idea that I came up with. The other one is on uh, on uh, NVIDIA is, is probably the opposite. And that is that um, looking a little bit rich in terms of valuation, um, this is, let me let me pull up a five-year chart. Yeah, uh, yeah Intel is, is bull put calendars. That way, if I get a sign, I still have some protection, especially in my trading account. Uh -huh. and, and NVIDIA is is bear calls. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> exactly. So that bull, bull put uh, on um, Intel and maybe take an ownership if I need to. I've got to put in place, then sell calls. Um, very limited risk. And NVIDIA, this is a five-year chart on NVIDIA. It just... I know you've been around forever. Do you remember we used to tell people like people who didn't want to buy stock is go, go trade NVIDIA. It's 15 bucks a share. <laughs> yeah. It was, and it had excellent liquidity. Um, it's a long way since $15 a share uh, back in those, those old days um, when it was back, this is a five-year chart would have been a good buy in the thirties for sure. But, you know, I don't know, um, you know, just looking at this chart and listening to what I'm saying and, and, we didn't talk much about it, but you know, you and I are both, I think, on the same page when it comes to analysts. Um, you know, I, I would glad I'm not an analyst, but I don't know that you can always trust what analysts say. They're not the smartest people in the world, and they have motives that are not usually aligned to you. So, if you're listening to somewhere on some media, social media site, or website, or or even watching CNBC or Bloomberg or even reading a report, the analyst has a motive. It's news, usually not aligned with giving you inside information for free. And, and they're not always smartest people. You're given some examples of um, some insight or some, some comments that are made and makes you just want to scream at the TV when you hear them say yeah. stuff. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, um, Greg, do you have any other... Go What's on. That, Greg? No, go ahead. No, I was going to, I was going to, what were you going to say, Barry? I was going to say, you know, even Karen, when you listen to her, um, and, and I love how she trades AMD because I trade it, I trade the same way. And sometimes I play a game when, when I listen to her to see, okay, did she do what I do? Or how are we, how are we, were we different? I always want to, it's almost like I want to go just pick up the phone and just talk to her about what we're doing. But, you know, even, you know, she'll say, you know, AMD in the nineties is a little bit stretched and um, probably needs to come in a little bit. Right. Uh, I think we've seen that across the board and it's just, and all you got to do is go to Finviz and look at NVIDIA and look at the charts underneath the, um, the, uh, all, all the data they give you and you can see it and you have to ask yourself, why is it so high when, you know, I mean, the reason we buy stock is the value of future discounted cash flow, and yeah, go down. Yeah. Put in NVIDIA. Yeah, that's NVIDIA. So we've got all these all these upgrades here. So go um there you go. Now go down. Like all the way down? Oh. Uh where's your where's your graphs at? You don't have the graphs. Bummer. Does you're not showing the graphs. You're in your you're in your finvis is different than mine. Um 
because what it I'm shows not logged in i'm using the free version so maybe oh okay um because what it shows is it shows the um it shows the last three years um and so nvidia is in is in their fiscal year 2024 so if you look at fiscal 2023, which just ended, they earned $1.76. And I've said this before. In 2021, they earned $1.76. No. So why is the stock so much higher? Because AI, Barry. We already talked about this. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's just, it is, it is. Yeah. That, that's the sentiment. It's purely sentiment. They're out there pushing it. I'm like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. To me, it's another sign that there is still an enormous amount of liquidity in this market. I mean, even though the Fed has tried to tighten things up and tried to slow things down, I don't think we really truly realize how much liquidity got actually pumped into the market. I know they said, oh, no, it just went to banks balance sheets and it didn't really go into the to the market. Well, somehow there is still an enormous amount of money chasing companies just like nvidia right now uh and you know i i I go back to something you just said barry i agree i'd love to you know the the long-term optimism of ai and and you know semis right now getting into chips seems exciting put my whole, whole portfolio in it on the other hand i do see what the fed's doing and i don't think they're done yet uh, and whether the and what I mean by I don't know that they may be done raising rates, but I don't know if the impact of what they have done is being felt fully in the economy yet. That's the I think the big unknown right now. And I think regardless of what industry you're trading right now, you still got to be cautious because we're in no we're in unknown territory from a economic standpoint right now. I, I, uh, if I was so blessed like you two gentlemen to be able to sit down and ask Chris Waller a question, the question I would ask him is, if it takes six to nine months for a, 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 a Fed rate hike to work its way into the economy, um, then we are just now really beginning to feel the effects of what you guys were doing last summer. And yet you're still pressing the accelerator. It's almost, yeah, it's almost- We're going to see him in a couple of weeks. So we'll ask him this question. You know, and I'm just, yeah, because I'm just like, you know, we're just, why do we, you know, I, in one sense, I'm like, you know, go 50 and say you're done, but to do a quarter and say there's maybe more, I, I don't know that that helped any, you know, I would have preferred, okay, 50, we're done. Now we're going to let's see what we've done. What effects is it going to have? Because we, you're right. We have not seen the full effect of all of these rate increases and they're still coming. Right. Which makes it a great time to call or trade. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. yeah. Just, well, yeah. Barry, I really wanted to say thank you. We've been talking about doing this for a while. I'm glad we're on. And I get a feeling we'll bring you back and talk more. I will see. I'd I'm love to. Sure no, this people, was really fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I really appreciate your generosity and your willingness to share. And man, you're just a great example of why this community is so awesome. We got people that are magnanimous and help you know willing to help and you mentioned having friends and i so many people have made friends through this community not just with greg and i but with each other and we've seen these relationships that have lasted decades decades or longer you know more than a decade anyways and um just we continue to grow and and bring more people in and you're going to be in Orlando in a couple of weeks, um, the 20, the Saturday, what is it? Uh, April um, 22nd. Yeah, 23rd or something like that. The 22nd, I think, Saturday, right? Yeah. Yeah. 23rd is a Sunday. Uh, and then the big one will be Austin in June. That's the 23rd and 24th. So, Barry, I hope, I don't know if you're, you got something going on that. Do we already talk about this? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I do. When you guys came to Vegas, I was already tied up, and it killed me because I wanted to go to that. I love Vegas; it's it's fun with you guys. It's so Austin is like California light, like San Francisco. Light. Yeah. Austin's like San Francisco in the middle of, of Texas. I spent a lot of time in Austin. There's probably a chance I, I can get out to Austin. Okay, well that would be Florida's out of the picture, but possibly Austin could be fun. Yes, better food, just as good of music. Yes, no craps tables. No craps tables. That's what killed me. Like, oh, 
you guys i heard vegas i'm like uh i would have felt but if you guys said san diego i wouldn't have felt so bad all right i mean that'd still be cool because that was my first summit was 2013 san diego never forget it summits are life-changing events you've got to do them for me definitely a pivot when i started i was just to be able to realize that there's other people out there who are like me is like just yeah it was I went from uh, my people feeling alone, wandering in the desert to I found my people. Um, well, all right, thank guys. You, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it, gentlemen. It was really fun. I'm happy to be happy to come back again. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Barry. Thanks everyone for for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and you know, add comments down here. If there's a question for Barry, maybe we can somehow get it to him and get some feedback on it as well. So, thanks for uh, hanging out with us today. Bye, bye, everyone. See ya.